Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Behind the Scenes of ACSM's Collection of Scientific Pronouncements, Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, Second Edition. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. This is a voice over IP webinar, meaning it's entirely web-based. If you experience audio difficulties or if the video begins to buffer, it's likely caused by the strength of your internet signal. If you're having issues, log off and log back on. If you have a question during the webinar, please type it into the question area within the GoToWebinar navigation, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. If your question goes unanswered, we'll take additional questions from today's webinar and post answers as a blog on the ACSM website at a later date. We also encourage you to join the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter by using the hashtag ACSMWebinar. Today's webinar will present the background and process behind developing ACSM's 14 new pronouncements and the, relevant, the relevance for current and future work. Our webinar presenters are members of the Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee, Dr. Katrina Piercy and Dr. Ken Powell. Dr. Piercy is a physical activity and nutrition advisor in the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion in the Department of Health and Human Services and serves as a dietitian officer in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. She advises agency and departmental, departmental officials on current physical activity and nutrition science to inform policies and programs related to health promotion and disease prevention. She served as a federal lead for the second edition of the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans. Her work involved overseeing the 17-member advisory committee as they executed an extensive systematic literature review on physical activity and health and compiled their findings into a scientific report. Additionally, as the lead policy writer, she guided the writing team to translate the committee's work into, into the guidelines. Dr. Piercy manages the physical activity portfolio within ODPHP, which includes the implementation of the recently released National Youth Sports Strategy. She also serves as a subject matter expert for the Move Your Way communications campaign to support and encourage more Americans to get the physical activity they need to stay healthy. Dr. Powell served as an epidemiologist with the CDC for 25 years and with the Georgia Department of Human Resources for eight years. He is now retired and lives in Atlanta. The relationship between physical activity and health has been an important theme during his career. He planned, chaired, and edited the papers from the first national workshop on the epidemiologic and public health aspects of physical activity and exercise in 1985. Dr. Powell was a member of the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee and a co-chair of the 2018 Advisory Committee. He is a graduate of Harvard College, the, the Northwestern University School of Medicine, and the Harvard School of Public Health. It is with great pleasure that we turn it over to you, Dr. Piercy. Great. Thank you so much, Gretchen, for that introduction. I'm excited to present on today's webinar and to give you a behind-the-scenes look at what the advisory committee did to develop their scientific report, as well as the process um, for how the work of the advisory committee came in together for the ACSM pronouncements. So a few things to highlight what I'll be talking about for the first part of this webinar before Dr. Powell speaks. Um, a little bit of the process of how the physical activity guidelines are developed. Um, the work of the physical activity guidelines advisory committee, which we abbreviate as PAGAC, as you see that on some slides. The role of the committee, also the role of the federal government, I'll talk through the literature review process and how they evaluated the current science, talk a bit, a bit about what is in the advisory committee scientific report, which will lead nicely into the work of the ACSM scientific pronouncements. So to give you a little bit of a history to start with, um, the first physical activity guidelines for Americans were released in 2008. It was the first time the federal government had developed specific guidance 
um, for the public on the amounts and types of physical activity needed for health benefits. Now, unlike the dietary guidelines for Americans, which is on a five-year cycle mandated by Congress to be released and looking at an update of the science, there's not a current mandate on the regularity of releasing the physical activity guidelines. So in 2013, as we were about five years after the first ones, um, a group of us in the federal government was thinking about what can we do to continue the work of the 2008, advise, or 2008 guidelines. And we came up with a mid-course report looking specifically at strategies to increase physical activity among youth. Realizing at this point that the science hadn't necessarily changed that would adjust the amounts or types of physical activity that were recommended, but we looked towards the future and were anticipating in 2018 we'd be able to put out updated physical activity guidelines, which is just what we did last November and in putting out the second edition. So just to remind everybody, and hopefully everyone on this webinar is aware of the actual guidelines, but these next two slides, just to make sure we're all starting at the same page, the guidelines for youth, um, the recommendation is at least 60 minutes a day of physical activity, and that includes activities that are vigorous intensity, bone strength activities, and muscle strengthening activities spread throughout the week. And for adults, the guidelines are 150 minutes or more of moderate intensity physical activity each week. Um, and two days a week of muscle strengthening activity. Now, you can also do some swaps with some vigorous intensity activity, which is also included here, but these are the general basic guidelines um, that are the premise of the physical activity guidelines. So how do we get to the guidelines? Um, it's actually a multi-year process to put out physical activity guidelines, or the same as what our office does with the dietary guidelines for Americans. We start this work by bringing in a physical activity guidelines advisory committee to help guide this process. They then spend um, close to two years reviewing the scientific evidence. We ask them to compile all of that into a scientific report. We then take that report um, on the federal government and develop the physical activity guidelines. And then we're in the last phase now, um, which continues after we release the guidelines and, and on is implementation throughout the federal government and beyond. And that's things like the Move Your Way Communications Campaign, which I'll talk about a bit as well. So let's start with the committee um, to dive in a little bit further about the work that they did and how this process started. So um, the way that the federal government gathers information is often through a federal advisory committee, um, and that work is governed by uh, the FACA Act, the Federal Advisory Committee Act. There's more details on this slide than you probably need, but the main things is how this relates to the Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee is at the bottom of the slide. Essentially, we bring in a group of academic experts to do an independent review of the science and provide their recommendations to the federal government. This group does not draft policy or implement federal policy, but they inform it by giving us a summary of the science base. I should also note that the FACA policy is what governs how um, these committees do their work. And so things like having all of the um, full committee meetings in public is one of the guidelines per FACA. Just want to thank and acknowledge the members of the 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee. So we had 17 esteemed academics who agreed to serve as part of this project. And when they do that, um, it's in a role as a special government employee. Um, so there are no, there's no compensation for this work. We do travel them in um, for meetings, but all of this work is done um, within their, their normal day-to-day -day work. So we truly ask a lot of this committee um, and really do appreciate the time and effort they put into this project. As it was mentioned in the bios, um, Dr. Ken Powell served as one of our co-chairs and provided some tremendous continuity across the work of the advisory committee and all of the subcommittees. But um, many of these individuals are members of ACSM or ACSM fellows and, and really brought a breadth of expertise to this, to this work. In addition to the 17 Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee members, we also had nine consultants. So as the committee got started with their work and organized themselves into subcommittees, there's a few topic areas where they realized they needed additional expertise. And so um, they reached out to some consultants, went through a similar vetting process as did all of the advisory committee members. Um, and these individuals often came on to support one or more subcommittees or a specific topic or question. And so they really added to the committee's work and added to their, their expertise and, and background, and we are much appreciative of their work as well. 
So um, just to talk a little bit about the roles. So when the advisory committee came in together, they were formally charged um, by the Assistant Secretary of Health um, to get, begin their work as a advisory committee. Um, and so their role was specifically to identify and develop the topics and questions to answer. And so um, we had a, a sense on the federal government side of what some of the areas were that um, really the science had emerged. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but back in 2014, we held a state of the science meeting at one of the ACSM annual meetings and brought together some experts in physical activity to talk about um, some of the topics that we thought might be emerging for the second edition of the guidelines. And so it was there some of the topics like sedentary behavior, um, light physical activity, some, some newer areas where the science had really evolved and developed from the 2008 physical activity guidelines. But really, the, the committee came in with the role to kind of say, what do we need to look at? What are the key areas? We had a tremendous literature review team that helped with this process, but the committee was really doing the work to implement that work and to actually review the evidence and summarize it, synthesize it, and grade it. Um, and then their, their big output, um, which was the expectation for the work on the advisory committee, was the scientific uh, committee report. So that was their main output that we were asking them as a committee to put together. Now, on the federal side, um, we were heavily involved in this process as well. So I'm in the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, and we were the lead office for this project. We worked closely, though, with staff from NIH, CDC, and the President's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition to oversee this work. And our main role was to make sure that the committee was following all of the guidance from FACA um, and that we were a part of uh, the process, uh, especially their committee work. So we helped the logistics, um, the coordination of bringing everybody into the D.C. area to have their meetings. Um, we also were a part of every subcommittee phone call, every conversation. Um, the committee was doing the work, but we were there listening and guiding when they needed it. Um, that also helped make sure that this same federal team was well-versed in all of what the committee had done, and we were comfortable and confident in translating their work into the physical activity guidelines. So how did they do their work? So we convened the advisory committee for the first time they came together in um, the summer of 2016. And one of the first things they did was divide into a group of subcommittees. And so they organized themselves in nine different subcommittees and there was a handful of advisory committee members on each subcommittee. So everybody was on two, sometimes three. And this kind of divided nicely based on the expertise of the advisory committee and then really the topics of importance for the advisory committee to look at. I mentioned that sedentary behavior was a new area. Um, the youth, for example, that subcommittee started looking at kids younger than age six, which was the starting threshold for the 2008 physical activity guidelines. Um, brain health was a newer area that was really expanded from before. Um, and then along the way, they also decided to come up with a series of work groups. Um, so these were kind of separate uh, from the subcommittees, but similar idea to be looking at um, those areas of fitness, pregnancy and postpartum, and then also the young adult transition. Um, and the way that they did this and the reason why setting up subcommittees is that then um, per the FACA rules, the subcommittees can do their work independently independently of the full committee. So the subcommittees were meeting um, weekly or biweekly um, throughout the process, and then they would bring their work to the full advisory committee meetings, and then the full committee would deliberate on that process and kind of what their conclusions were and where the evidence was. So um, that's a very efficient way, and a lot of uh, this is a, a common way that advisory committees do their work by dividing things out. Um, so how did they actually review the science? I mentioned that we had a literature review team that helped guide this process, but it really was the committee that drafted all of the questions to really start at. So in total, they ended up with 38 main questions, 104 sub-questions. Um, they were looking particularly as to what information could be updated from the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee. So they started um, with that work, and for several searches, they were able to go back to the, age, the, the date range of where the searches were from 2008 and update those, and several areas were new pieces that they wanted to look at. Um, 
And then finally, the last piece that we had asked them was to identify new areas of research. And um, I'll mention this a bit more about their research recommendations, but um, sometimes they would draft a question and start looking at it and realize that the science wasn't there yet to address that. So that's something that became a research need. So talking about the process. Um, so they did a very extensive review of the literature. So this was a systematic review process and it started by developing the questions. Um, this was all done within the subcommittees. From there, they would work with the literature review team to develop the strategy of how they would approach the question and what evidence to look at. The literature review team was instrumental in doing the actual search, the screening, and uh, looking at what evidence needed to be reviewed along with a team of librarians. From there, the data was extracted um, and the risk of bias assessed to be looking at whether um, the articles selected um, would fit into the criteria. The committee then um, had the work to really describe the evidence. So they did a lot of reading um, over the, it was just about two years that the committee was engaged, but they were summarizing the evidence and completing um, what we called an evidence portfolio that kind of summarized the high level key findings of what the current state of the science was for a particular area or a particular question. And then from there, they were actually drafting that information into the scientific report. So we on the federal side, worked with them to develop a template for each chapter of the advisory committee report um, that all of the subcommittees could follow so there was some consistency in how they laid out the questions and summarized the evidence um, and drafted the conclusions themselves. So one of the things this uh, slide here shows the process um, for looking at the sources of evidence. This is from an article um, that one of our literature review team members published in JPA. Um, and so if you're interested more in the methodology and all of the work, I'll, I'll highlight some pieces here, but there is an extensive methodology chapter in the advisory committee report, as well as this article in JPA that really um, dives into the process of things. So if we start at the top here, there's a systematic review question. Um, the committee agreed to start with looking for existing reviews and reports rather than going to original research realizing that there's a tremendous volume of systematic reviews and meta-analysis now, especially in the fields of physical activity and health outcomes. And so they started there. Um, there's pros and cons to that approach. But um, by starting there, it really gave the committee uh, more time to address more questions, more areas, because um, often there had been systematic reviews or a couple of them that they could draw from and really have access to the work of many original research articles. Um, from there, um, if there was not existing reviews or reports identified, so for a handful of questions, there just didn't exist um, systematic reviews, and from there, as you see it goes down to the bottom on the far right side, then original research was search. If there was existing systematic reviews, meta-analysis, things like that, um, note they did not look at gray literature, so this is all published peer review literature for this process. Um, they would look at that compared to the inclusion-exclusion criteria, um, determine if that answered the question, and if so, it would go through the process to abstract the data and look at the risk of bias and the quality assessment. Um, if it did not fully answer the question, sometimes there was a combination of looking at the systematic reviews and then perhaps a small search of the original research to identify um, the additional research that would answer the question. So. Um, that's kind of the, the main process that was taken for all of the questions. Um, so this is about a two-year process to go through all of the literature. So um, part of what I, I hope everyone can take away from this webinar is just the, the massive breadth and the scope um, that the advisory committee undertook and kind of summarizing all of the current science and, and how you all as ACSM members can then use this work. Um, all of the work that's done by the federal government or special government employees that is, the advisory committee is free and open to the public to, to use um, and take a look at. So all of the, the systematic reviews, all the research that was done is all available. So they've got all the science. Um, they've got the data abstracted. They're looking at, you know, ones that only are uh, low risk of bias and high quality and things like that. And so then the committee from there, they agreed to... Um, an evidence grading criteria grid. So there's a lot of information on this slide, but basically it's just to show you um, kind of the, the guiding piece of, of how the committee really looked at that work and graded the evidence. 
So for the purposes of the physical activity guidelines and for writing federal policy, we on the federal side were particularly important particularly interested in evidence that was graded as strong or moderate, which is why I've boxed those out um, in orange to highlight those pieces. The criteria that the committee was looking at, um, and this was across every question and every sub-question, was really the applicability, the generalizability, the risk of bias or study limitations. As I mentioned, that was risk of bias was done for, for all the work as well. The quantity and consistency of the results across the available studies and then the magnitude and the precision of the effect. So these were a lot of the points that the committee members were discussing when they came together for their public meetings. They had five of them in total. And during those meetings, a subcommittee would present on their findings of a question and their grading of the evidence um, and kind of how it fit into those criteria. And then that would lead to discussion across the committee um, to make sure that there was full consensus from the entire committee on the level of evidence to answer a particular question. So, and this table I should note too, was adopted uh, and adapted from work from the 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans Advisory Committee. So this is a similar grading criteria um, rubric that has been used previously. So let's talk about the Advisory Committee scientific report. Um, as you can see, there's a picture here um, on the slide. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at the actual report, um, it's about 800 pages of text. So fairly lengthy document, um, really summarizing all of the work of the committee. Uh, tremendous piece of literature and um, realizing that many people probably haven't read the full report. So that's part of why we were so excited to be able to work with ACSM on the scientific pronouncements, because that basically takes apart um, the advisory committee report and puts it into manageable pieces um, where people can go and read the specific manuscript uh, with a topic of interest to them, because many people, I'm guessing, probably won't pick up and read all 800 pages, but um, we're thrilled that by putting them into the ACSM scientific pronouncements, it's a way to make it more accessible. So um, let's talk a bit about the scientific report and policy, that is the physical activity guidelines. So we got this question a lot as the committee was doing this work, and I think uh, it's worth kind of talking this through a little bit again here. Um, there was especially a lot of confusion after the advisory committee delivered the report to the secretary of HHS, that's their last phase of the process, um, that there was the, the assumption that that was a draft of the actual policy. And so this slide kind of outlines the two different pieces. So the advisory committee report is your middle column, and this is the committee's science-based conclusions and rationale based on their review of the literature. So it's set up as I said, within the subcommittees of here's the question, here's the literature, here's the conclusion on that. They are the main authors, they being the advisory committee. We were involved on the federal side, but they wrote this document. The target really is to the federal government. Um, so this is what they were charged to, to summarize their evidence and provide that to the government. And then we use that to inform the development of the physical activity guidelines um, and also to inform evidence gaps because they have a list of research needs from the full committee as well as needs by each subcommittee. The guidelines are really a synthesis of the work of the advisory committee. So it's a much smaller document, about 100 pages, where we synthesize the actual guidelines. And that's where you see um, the actual pieces and the quantification of how much physical activity the American public needs. And so that's taking all of the literature from the committee and distilling that down into, for example, the 150 minutes a week that adults need of physical activity. The author is the federal government, specifically the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So we had a team of experts in physical activity, public health policy that actually wrote the physical activity guidelines. Uh, the target for the guidelines themselves are policymakers and health professionals. So all of you on today's webinar, members of ACSM, academics, those in practice um, kind of working in this space. If you read it, the language is not written for the general consumer. Um, and so that's why we go a step further and develop the Move Your Way communications campaign that really talks about specifically how the physical activity guidelines can be put into practice. So the guidelines themselves um, become kind of a foundational piece as the federal policy. Um, and so that feeds into other federal initiatives, um, things like healthy people objectives. If you look at the physical activity topic area, they are right in line with the work of the physical activity guidelines. And that will be happening moving forward um, as we look to the release of the Healthy People 2030 objectives next spring. 
also NIH surveillance and CDC surveillance, also um, look at the physical activity guidelines um, as a foundation piece from the policy side of things, and things like the Presidential Youth Fitness Program, also related to the guidelines work. So what's in the scientific report? I've highlighted most of this already. So in the 800 pages or so, um, you've got some detailed methodology. There's questions, evidence reviewed, all of the pieces for each of the questions the subcommittees looked at um, and a research needs. There's also, I mentioned evidence portfolios the advisory committee developed and each um, question, each question's evidence portfolio is all available online. So that even goes beyond the 800 pages. I've got the website here for the advisory committee report itself. Um, so if you want to know more information of like what exact studies were actually looked at to um, answer that question, that is all available for to use um, online. So a couple of key takeaways. So I mentioned we take the advisory committee report and then translate into the guidelines. So I wanted to just highlight some of the pieces that we were looking at as kind of the highlights per each of the subcommittees. So um, this is just very quick snapshot, these next two slides, um, highlighting some of the work. I'll just talk through a few of these to give you some sense of the work of the committee. So uh, you see the subcommittees on the far left side, aging, brain health, cancer, cardiometabolic health, and weight management and then exposure, um, highlighting some of the populations that they looked at. Um, for example, brain health looked at all individuals across the lifespan, and so the outcome highlighted here is the risk of developing depression. If you look specifically into the brain health section in the guidelines or the chapter in the advisory committee report, you'll find much more information about the stratification of populations by ages and specific outcomes, things like anxiety and mental health, um, cognition, academic performance, things like that in kids. So this kind of gives just a, uh, a picture of some of the, the positive benefits and just to highlight too that this is all strong or moderate evidence, which is the threshold for what becomes a part of federal policy. And then this next slide here, so just finishing up the work of the subcommittees, I will note that the pregnancy was one of the work groups. Um, they ended up having a whole separate chapter in the advisory committee report. Um, so I've included them here with the subcommittee list as they really, there was uh, enough evidence to really look at women who are pregnant or postpartum as a separate um, population and look at some specific outcomes of the benefits of physical activity. But the takeaway really is that across the board, in many different populations, many different ages, uh, many different um, types of activity as well, there's tremendous benefits to doing regular physical activity. Um, overarching research needs, as I mentioned, the work of the advisory committee, um, they, uh, within each subcommittee, came up with a list of research needs by that subcommittee. So often these were related to the questions they were looking to answer. Then they pulled back together and looked across the board at what are some of the overarching research needs here. I've highlighted a few pieces in bold just to highlight um, some areas. So physical activity and sedentary behavior. Obviously, this is a newer area where the literature is really growing. Um, looking at light intensity physical activity, um, how that is related to moderate or vigorous intensity and what some of those health outcomes. Intervention strategies for increasing physical activity. So we had a physical activity promotion subcommittee for the first time that kind of looked at this what works piece, <clears throat> learning more about the dose response relationship with physical activity and health outcomes. Um, also looking across within these health outcomes, the demographic factors, um, how they made, uh, may have made an impact. This is one of the pieces that uh, I think just about every question that the advisory committee was asking was, you know, is there a relationship and does that vary by demographic factor? And one of the challenges of doing the review of reviews, so looking at, you know, systematic review and meta-analysis is that often the demographic factors were not pulled forward. Um, and so they either had to go back to the original research um, to look at those and oftentimes either they weren't noted or they weren't um, analyzed by demographic factor. So that was definitely a challenge because the committee was interested to try to note if there were differences um, and the literature in many times didn't allow them to make any of those statements. And then finally, data collective systems um, that will enhance surveillance of physical activity and tracking and monitoring, including meeting the guidelines and, and other related areas. So let's talk about the guidelines for a moment itself, just to give you a piece of things. Hopefully you all have had a chance to read the guidelines, look through them, have seen this information on a, on a prior webinar, 
Um, but just one slide here to highlight some of the new pieces. That tends to be the, the common theme. So right after we put out um, a new piece, the question immediately is, what's different? Um, and so what's new is kind of our what's different piece. If you look compared to the 2008 physical activity guidelines, really had an expanded science base. We were able to go down starting at age three. So in 2008, it started at age six, and it talked about that there's benefits of physical activity younger than age six, but they couldn't make a quantitative recommendation. Uh, we have some more information on the benefits of um, kids that are in preschool childcare age, an increased discussion of sedentary behavior and how that interacts with health outcomes. Um, big piece was the removal of the 10 minute bout requirement. So previously for adults, um, the guidance was given of doing physical activity at least 10 minutes or longer. The committee looks specifically at this piece. Um, and so this is a, a clear area where the committee came back and said, really, there is not evidence to suggest that there needs to be a minimum bout threshold. So that was perfect that they had reviewed that science and we could take that and translate it into the guidelines. As you saw on the previous slides were some tables of some of the benefits. We know even more for some of these health benefits. A little bit more also in the area of some of the acute benefits of kind of the feeling better, um, immediate blood pressure responses and things like that, as well as more chronic disease outcomes. And then finally, as I said, we had a subcommittee that looked at that physical activity promotion and what works. So what does this mean to you all? How can uh, ACSM members use this information in the guidelines? Well, um, we have the Move Your Way campaign. As I mentioned before, this was developed to support the work of the physical activity guidelines and to provide um, a distilled uh, set of information that was targeted to different populations to help raise awareness of the guidelines themselves, but really also to promote behavior change among consumers. And we really were targeting physical activity contemplators, so people not yet meeting the guidelines. We know um, for adolescents and adults, it's less than 25% of Americans who are meeting the aerobic and muscle strengthening guidelines. So um, there's a very large segment of our population who's not yet there yet. So um, this, this work and this communications campaign really does target a pretty wide population. Just to highlight some of the resources, again, this being government work, all of these are free and available to use and download. The first thing on the far left side is an interactive tool to help people plan the week. Um, we got this from feedback from some healthcare professionals saying that, you know, they could tell um, their patients 150, minute week, 150 minutes was their target, but being able to break it down and help people plan out a week of, you know, take a walk here, do some muscle strengthening here. Here's how you could um, have a sample week and meet the guidelines. Posters and fact sheets that are targeted to a variety of different audiences. And then a series of videos as well. So finally, um, to wrap up my side of things, Shaw talking a little bit about the scientific pronouncements and kind of what does that mean and how those came together. Um, so this is um, information from the ACSM website about what a pronouncement is. Um, and so there was discussions with the ACSM team um, that started a few years back about um, if the work of the advisory committee could become one of the ACSM pronouncements. And the 14 articles were published in the June 2019 issue of Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise. And one of the tremendous things about going through this process is that all of those articles are open access. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look at them and download them, they're all free um, to use and download. So I thought one way to um, kind of give a little bit of an introduction, there's a very brief about one minute video. Dr. Bill Krauss, who's the current ACSM president, um, gives a nice overview of what what the pronouncements are and what, what does that mean? So let me switch to that. Hello, the American College of Sports Medicine is bringing you this collection of 14 articles that present the science behind the updated physical activity guidelines. The collection, written by members of the Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee, outline the evidence available about the relationship between physical activity and a myriad of health outcomes. Besides the introduction paper, all other papers serve as pronouncements of the college. Having the papers in one collection will provide health and fitness professionals, as well as basic and applied sciences, with the information you need for your professional work. Speaking for the committee, we hope you enjoy the collection and will make good use of this resource. 
So let me flip back and finish up my slides. Um, but that gives you kind of a really quick overview, the one minute takeaway from the scientific pronouncements and how they're relevant to ACSM members. Um, this next slide just has a list of all of the titles. Uh, there's 14 in total. Um, and as you can see, these line up really nicely with the work that the advisory committee developed. Um, things like high intensity interval training, sedentary behavior, um, benefits of physical activity during pregnancy and postpartum, and how these actually came together. So the committee did this work um, and developed the scientific pronouncements after their work had finished as part of um, the federal government advisory committee. So there was a lot of discussion about what topics were relevant and which areas of their work could be expanded um, for these scientific pronouncements. Many of the subcommittees updated the literature. So um, just to give you a quick timeline sense of things, the advisory committee delivered their scientific report in February of 2018. The ACSM scientific pronouncements came out in June of 2019. So a lot of this work was happening um, during the spring, summer, and fall of 2018. And so um, there had been a little bit of time since the literature review had been finished for the advisory committee work. So several of them worked. We had um, several literature review team members agreed to stay on and expand the literature review search timeframe. So um, the ACSM scientific pronouncements are actually even a little bit more current than what's in the advisory committee report. There was also several manuscripts um, where federal co-authors were a part of that process since we were a part of the subcommittees and the work along the way. Um, so we um, helped provide review and input uh, as part of that process. So I'll leave you with this last slide here, and you'll see this also at the, again, at the end when we get to questions, but just some of the websites and things that I've mentioned, the ACSM pronouncements, the Advisory Committee Scientific Report, the guidelines themselves, and the Move Your Way campaign. I'll next think, turn things over to Dr. Ken Powell. As I mentioned, he was the co-chair of the Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee, um, and he can talk a little bit more about their work as the committee and how um, the ACSM pronouncements uh, relate to this. Okay, am I up now? Ready to go? Um, how do I make it so that you can see my slides, show my screen? Hi, Dr. Powell. We, um, I believe we, oh, they're up now. We can see your okay. slides. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much, Gretchen, and thank you, Katrina, for that really nice uh, summary of the overall process of the guidelines and, and the development of the pronouncements. I just have a very few comments about how I think these pronouncements uh, may be useful to ACSM members. Uh, first of all, is just to remind you that physical activity is a real cornucopia of health benefits. On this slide on the left, you see a list of the benefits that were described back in 2008 in the scientific uh, report from the advisory committee. And on the right is a list of the benefits that were added in 2018. Now, you'll remember that this list contains a lot of common, severe, and expensive diseases of major public health importance. But these lists also point out that more physically active people, they think better, they feel better, they sleep better, and they conduct their daily lives with more energy and less fatigue. What more could anyone possibly want? You who are interested in the field of physical activity are in the right field. It's a very, very important topic. Uh, the second thing I want to emphasize is that the American College of Sports Medicine has played an important role in the process and making the information that the committee worked so hard to prepare uh, more readily available to everyone. Now, Katrina and Bill have already uh, described the recently published announcements, and they are worthy in their own right but they're also an important advancement of the whole physical activity guidelines process. Now here, the official advisory committee scientific reports from 2008 on the left, uh, 
and from 2018 on the right, are both excellent scientific documents. They're each around 700 pages long, and they are easily available on the web. They're easy to find if you know that you're looking for them, but neither is included in PubMed or other digital scientific search engines. And as a result, they do not appear if someone is searching and looking for information on a specific topic. Now, the members of the 2018 Scientific Advisory Committee were looking for ways to make the information in our report more easily discoverable by other scientists. And fortunately, ACSM saw an opportunity not only to make that information more readily available, but also to develop some ACSM pronouncements at the same time. This has been a win-win-win-win uh, situation for everyone in our field. In addition, the ACSM has been conducting a well-organized and concerted effort to publicize the physical activity guidelines for Americans and the underlying science, first to its members and through its members to the American public. The ACSM has had a regular blog about various topics that you can see listed here and now are having a series of webinars such as this one about the guidelines. So I think you should be proud to be an ACSM, or ACSM member. The, the organization is really doing important things. Uh, finally, just a few words about the practical utility of the pronouncements that grow from the advisory committee scientific report. First, obviously there's a great deal of current and useful information in these pronouncement papers. This is a reprise of the list that Katrina just showed you a little while ago. The 14 pronouncement papers include four about specific aspects of physical activity itself, three pertaining to specific population subgroups, six about specific disease outcomes, and one about physical activity promotion. If you want to get up to date on any of these topics, here is a great place to go. Uh, in addition, each of these papers includes a list of important research needs for that topic. Katrina has mentioned the list of overarching cross-cutting research needs that's in our scientific report. And there are a few other topics uh, where research needs can be found in our report also. But for the most part, I think what you're interested in, in finding out about research needs will be in these 14 pronouncement papers. Finally, these papers contain a number of practical suggestions. One of the most important and interesting things, I think anyway, in the pronouncement papers is this heat map that is in the map on sedentary behavior and was developed by the full committee. The colors in the heat map indicate the risk of death, with red being high risk and green being low risk. The y-axis is the daily sitting time, high sitting time at the top and low at the bottom. And the x-axis is the amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So you can see that the high risk is in the upper left corner, which is the most time sitting and no MVPA. And the heat map shows that for highly sedentary individuals, replacing sedentary time with light intensity physical activity actually reduces risk of mortality. Moving down the y-axis without adding MVPA does indeed reduce risk. However, the risk remains elevated until some MVPA is added. It also shows that high levels of MVPA appear to counterbalance high sitting times. The amount of time, it's about 35 or 36 uh, met hours per week, which depending upon the, the intensity of the activity would take 100 minutes per day at three mets, 
or 40 minutes per day at eight METs. Other practical suggestions included in uh, the pronouncement papers are things like elderly individuals benefit more from multifaceted rather than single focus physical activity regimens. Bouts of MBPA less than 10 minutes of duration also contribute to the beneficial total of MBPA. And there are a wide variety of types of interventions that can help people become more physically active. These pronouncements are based on solid scientific evidence and they also contain a number of practical information based on that same solid scientific evidence. Uh, that's what I wanted to say and so uh, Gretchen I'll pass it back to you now. Excellent, thank you so much uh, Dr. Powell and Dr. Piercy. Uh, we do have some questions um, from our audience and we have a few minutes for those. Um, let me let me start, I think, uh, what were some of the surprise findings, and either of you can answer these questions, so it's not one or the other. Um, what were some of the surprise findings that emerged in this edition of the PAGAC scientific report? Surprise findings. Uh, I don't know that I would want to say I was surprised. I, I think it was very good that we were able to develop the information demonstrating that bouts less than 10 minutes are, uh, are as beneficial as, as uh, longer bouts. I think uh, from my perspective, the one thing that emerged more clearly now than was evident before had to do with the sort of the everyday, how do you feel benefits of regular physical activity, that you think better, feel better, sleep better sort of thing. I, I had felt that for myself for many years, but the evidence wasn't there. So I can't say I was really surprised, but it was really the first time I think that the evidence was as convincing and solid as it currently is. Katrina, you have something you wanna add? Uh, no, I, th I think you hit the exact two pieces that I was probably going to mention that I agree. I don't think it was necessarily surprising, but it was it was very reassuring, um, especially when how we message physical activity in the, the federal government. So like before um, you all did your work, especially around the 10 minute bounce, we would say things like park farther away or take the stairs instead of the elevator or go down the hall instead of sending an email. Um, but we really didn't have the science all pulled together to really conclusively say, yes, there are benefits to doing that little bit, like that every little bit adds up and that counts. Um, and that is important. And so we just thought it was great that the committee really honed in on that and looked at um, those pieces of the, the shorter bouts and kind of, it, it really helps the public health message for us to be able to tell people if you've got a few minutes, you know, to, to do something and that something is better than, than nothing. So I would have to concur with what you said. Great, thank you. Um, our next question um, is, do or did you work with the folks at the National Physical Activity Plan with that, that group? So I'll talk about that. So actually within HHS, we have an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with the National Physical Activity Plan Alliance. Um, that's within our office, ODPHP, CDC, and the President's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition. Um, we've had that MOU in place with their group uh, for some time now, realizing that the National Physical Activity Plan Alliance um, really is a great uh, compilation of many physical activity organizations doing work um, around uh, and across the United States and other areas. And so um, the Physical Activity Plan Alliance was not a part of you know, writing the work of the advisory committee or the guidelines, really a lot of their work and involvement is helping to promote um, the physical activity guidelines. Um, they did offer to host a webinar that I presented on last November. It's still on their um, YouTube channel if you want a more of a dissected discussion of what is actually in the physical activity guidelines themselves. So that's an example of uh, some ways that we've partnered with them to be able to get information out from the federal government to more of the stakeholders and organizations in this space. And so um, 
we are, have a had a great relationship and continue to have a great relationship with with them and that organization. Good. Uh, we have some methodology questions, so um, we'll kind of cluster those together a little bit. Some of the pronouncements published from the scientific report are based on systematic reviews, and some are based on umbrella reviews. Can you describe the differences between those two methodologies? Why are some papers based on systematic reviews and others are based on umbrella reviews? Sure, I'll touch on that a bit. I think it's a little bit of semantics, um, but really all of the work of the advisory committee went through a full systematic review process. And so that can also be called like an umbrella review to be pulling in all of this information um, in a systematic way. Um, so I know some of the ACSM scientific pronouncements were really making a clear distinction and referring to it as an umbrella review, um, but essentially the same process, um, the same steps were done for all of the questions that the advisory committee looked at, and it was a systematic review process, um, some of which the questions focused on systematic reviews and meta-analysis, if there was sufficient evidence to answer the question, some of which uh, focused on original research. So it kind of depended on, on the question itself. Um, another um, methodology-related uh, question, uh, to what extent did the reporting of primary research affect your ability to look at subgroup analysis gender, race, disease burden, um, that is, was there ample primary research that that reported findings by gender, race, et cetera, for you to answer those types of questions? So I mentioned that actually um, in the, the presentation with the webinar that that was definitely a challenge um, by looking at uh, a lot of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Many of them did not um, re either did not report the demographics or did not do any analysis by demographics. And so often the committee may have been looking to original research to see if that information was contained there. Um, that is a limitation that um, the committee is aware of, of kind of going through this process and it should be something to to think about um, if you're doing a systematic review and want to be able to get in and do subgroup analysis um, that sometimes can be a challenge um, and that also is noted as a research need to be able to really look at information and how um, and whether different differences may gr exist by demographics so um, I, I think to the extent possible the committee was trying to pull out that information but uh, largely for many of the questions that information just simply did not exist in the literature. Let me just add a, a little bit to that. Uh, Katrina is right. We did our best to try to find that information for the questions where we were using umbrella reviews, looking only at, at meta-analyses. Um, that information is commonly not included in, in the write-up of the meta-analyses. So there it was unusual. But even when we were, were using original research papers, uh, there often simply wasn't enough information provided about subgroup analysis. And, and we found the same thing in 2008, uh, back when all of our reviews then were, were done with uh, uh, looking at the primary literature. I think the primary literature today, 10 years later, is, is doing better, but that's still an area that we would really like to have a lot more information. Okay, and I think that kind of leads us uh, maybe into the next question a little bit. Um, what are some of the more compelling gaps in the liter literature that you hope are addressed uh, prior to the next edition um, of the uh, scientific report and guidelines. I'll go first on this, Katrina. You can fill it in later. I, for me, from my perspective, the thing that's that's missing and not done anywhere near often enough is to look carefully at the dose response. If we're trying to determine, you know, how much, what kind of physical activity is needed to be done in order to bring about these benefits, we really need to have better, not, not quite better, we need to have good dose response information on more outcomes than we have. 
we currently have pretty good dose response curves for all cause mortality, for uh, heart disease, cardiovascular outcomes, pretty good for diabetes, but for almost everything else, we just don't have the same uh, volume and, and quality of information about the dose response. And it may turn out that for some kinds of outcomes, the dose of physical activity that's needed is going to be less or more than uh, the current recommendations. And in order to, to find that out, we really have to have these, <clears throat> these dose response curves uh, studied more carefully. And I, I definitely agree that's a, a great area that I, I hope we'll see more and there'll be more evidence when we look at this again in the future. Um, some other areas that I think we'll probably be able to see more is the impact or the importance of or how light intensity physical activity um, factors into that. Um, so a lot of the evidence we have is on moderate intensity and vigorous intensity physical activity and that's the basis for the guidelines. Um, but as we are able to measure physical activity better and in different ways, um, starting to see how light intensity physical activity factors into that. Again, the committee looked at that a bit, um, but the literature really seems to be growing on, on how, to, how does that um, translate or what's the relationship with, with light intensity physical activity and some health outcomes. Um, I hope we'll see a little bit more also in younger kids. So as I mentioned, we expanded down uh, for youth ages three to five, but we don't have a quantitative recommendation for them. We provide a target, um, was, as it so happens, is, is similar to or the same as what some other countries have. They've come out with some specific quantitative guidelines for younger kids, um, but I see the literature uh, continuing to emerge there that we might be able to know more in terms of a dose response for that population. Um, so uh, I see a number of areas. I mean, the literature grew considerably from 2008 to the 2018 physical activity guidelines. We're anticipating that we, we probably will uh, and may continue a 10-year cycle, so be looking at the evidence again um, in 2028 uh, for this next process. So, But that's a few of the areas uh, that I think we'll probably uh, hopefully have more literature to examine moving forward. I'd like to add one other area. Thanks. Katrina, those are both all very good. Uh, things that that uh, we're going to be needing. One area that I think deserves considerably more attention has to do with uh, physical activity promotion. And like Katrina said, we did have uh, a focus on that this year and we were delighted to be able to add that. Uh, it wasn't done in 2008 and we did learn a lot. There's a lot of information about the efficacy of a wide variety of different kinds of physical activity uh, promotion, different kinds of interventions. And at least to my eyes, as to read the chapter and think about it, what we're seeing is that there are a lot of different kinds of interventions that are by statistical measures effective in promoting physical activity, but none of them have a very large effects. And what that's going to mean for us, I think, is that uh, in order to really make uh, inroads and encourage the population to become more physically active and to get these benefits that we really want everyone to have, we're going to need to be putting together packages of different kinds of physical activity interventions. So I think that the future research is going to need to do more than just look at a single kind of uh, information of uh, intervention and see if that works. We're gonna need to be looking at packaging. And the other great area of need in, in the same arena is that it is likely that the demographic subgroups will have a significant impact on which interventions and which types of groups of interventions work in different kinds of populations. And I think that uh, 
while we see some differences in disease outcomes by uh, demographics, we're going to see more uh, differences when we start looking at the intervention. So th that I think health promotion, physical activity promotion in general is an area that needs uh, to continue to expand and, and use and develop some new methods to, to stundle, study these bundles better. Well, thank you uh, both Dr. Uh, Piercy and Dr. Powell. Thanks to everyone for attending today. Um, as a final reminder, uh, an email with a link to the recorded version of the webinar will be sent within the next one or two days. Uh, in that email, though, there will also be a short survey, and we'd appreciate your feedback on today's session. Have a great afternoon, and that concludes today's webinar.